Okay, and we're back. Um, so you probably all know Rob. If nothing else, you ask him to um, clear the storage on Hydra. <laughs> um, it's not the only thing he does, and uh, actually he'll tell us everything about what he does. Well, thank you. I hope you guys can hear me. Um, I'll try to keep you entertained for uh, about half an hour or 40 minutes until we go for lunch. And then, of course, that's the best part of the day. So, so I'm Rob Formaas. Uh, I work for a company called LogicBlocks. And you might have heard the name around on the IRC channel or saw it on the wiki. Um, so this is my contact information if you ever want to uh, talk to me. I'm most of the time on the IRC uh, on most uh, late times as well. So uh, just uh, we're there to help. I mean, just like the whole NixOS community, they're awesome uh, and very helpful, usually on IRC. Um, so I would like to tell you a bit about who I am and what I did uh, with Nix. Um, so I kind of uh, looked back at, uh, at my commits and I found the first commit in 2004. Uh, when I added uh, Octave. That was because I was, uh, I used to be a student at the Uni University of Utrecht, which is also the place where Nix was de developed originally. So uh, Ilke Dossai was one of my uh, fellow, stu uh, fellow students. I mean, he was a bit uh, older, so uh, he finished before me. Uh, but after my studies, I went to work there. Uh, and we, I was working on a project called Stratego XT, which made uh, like, a, it's like a language for to build compilers. And that consisted of like 20 autoconf packages. And of course, to build that, <laughs> that's terrible. So what did we do is we actually started using the work that Ilko was working on, and Nix actually uh, built and actually sent to the users uh, this project. So that was nice. Um, then we actually moved to the TU Delft, where I actually worked on uh, Hydra. Uh, and a bit on NixOps, and I've also contributed to Nix. Uh, like Rock explained, I also do a lot of infrastructure support for, the, uh, let's say, the infrastructure that we have, so Hydra, the website. Uh, I do that together with Ilko Dolstra, sometimes Sander is helping, and there are uh, NixOS community members who help with that as well, but basically more on the web UI, uh, not on the back end of uh, the servers. Also, <coughs> this year, we started the NixOS Foundation, which is meant to support, uh, to give a kind of a vehicle for people to give us donations so that we can keep all this infrastructure running. Uh, so I would like to encourage you to give us all your money so we can do all kinds of awesome stuff. Uh, so as I explained, I work for LogicBlocks. Uh, we develop a state-of-the-art uh, database <laughs> system that is used to develop applications for many top retailers and banks. So that's a marketing statement. I'm not going to tell you too much about Logic Blocks because it's actually not too interesting for you guys because it's uh, not necessarily like an open pro product that you can actually use. You have to work together with us. Uh, but what is important is that we have a few uh, Nixers. So first of all, of course, me. Uh, I'm doing the presentation. But also Ilko Dolstra. I don't know where he is there. <laughs> Everybody knows Ilko. Uh, our CTO is Martin Braveboer. Uh, you probably haven't seen many commits of, the, of him lately, uh, because I think his last commit was in 2008. Uh, but he was actually using uh, Nix uh, very early on as well. Uh, at some point, Shay uh, Levy, uh, is also a, a, a good uh, community member, he works for us. And uh, we sometimes hire contractors to do work for us uh, that we cannot do ourselves because of capacity reasons. Uh, so Yevgeny, uh, he uh, has worked for us, uh, many people will uh, know him as Freedom on IRC. So what I usually do when I have a talk about Nix, I would like to remind myself why I <laughs> use Nix, because I think it's very important to, to kind of reflect over why you do things. So my first point is always Nix protects me against me. <laughs> so I make software and I break all kinds of shit all the time. So I'm very good at making bugs. So I like the feature that I can just roll back because that kind of uh, gives a safety net that we actually uh, need. Well, that I actually need. You, are, of course, are like perfect programmers and never make bugs. Um, but also, I'm very forgetful. So unless I make something that's completely automated, I forget how to do things. And what Nix does, it actually uh, gives me a vehicle to do things consistently multiple times and on different machines. 
And that takes away a lot of the pain that I have with software development. And I'm sure you guys have that as well. Um, what it also does is it exposes the things I forget, like implicit dependencies. I mean, we all know when you start a project that's existing and you make an X expression for it, oh man, there are so many implicit dependencies and so many assumptions being made. So Nix exposes what I forget to, uh, to actually declare, and therefore it helps, let's say, the previous uh, uh, things that I wrote. Um, so one, <laughs> another thing is that over the course of time, we actually have developed all kinds of tools, uh, like uh, Nix, NixOS, Hydra, and NixOps, and now we have just one language to rule them all, uh, like it says on the Wi-Fi password. So that's what I like, and I hope you guys like it as well. So, <laughs> my uh, presentation is basically uh, a call out to make sure that you guys uh, start Nixifying companies. So, this will be a crash course in how to actually do this. Uh, so, there's a three step plan uh, find a nice company, which I did with Logiblocks. I'm sure you guys have nice companies as well. You apply Nix wherever you can. Because people and companies will have problems that need to be solved, and they can typically be solved very nicely with Nix, so just do it. And step three, we have profit, or salary, or whatever kind of your system is. So that's basically my three-step plan. <coughs> um, so when you build software, uh, you build software, you want to make sure that you run tests, and you want to have it run somewhere. So I call... Uh, we have four components that I call the big four. Sander will probably say, no, you have to have five because this Nix is also part of that. But in my case, we don't use this Nix yet, so it's the big four. So first of all, Nix, which covers this whole pipeline. Uh, of course, Hydra we use for building and testing. And NixOps and NixOS actually get it deployed on systems. So you get to a company that exists already, I think in the case of LogicBlocks, it existed for 10 years already, so there's a lot of software there. And what do you get? Bash scripts. Something called Jenkins, I don't know if you've worked with it, it's terrible, you have to maintain machines, all, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and of course people want to use uh, enterprise operating systems like CentOS or Red Hat Linux, which I get the shivers from. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> Of course, I want to change everything, but you can't change everything at the same time. So, yeah. Um, so, what you just as a first step do, because you can't immediately deploy it with Nix or Nix Ops, you basically make sure that you do your builds, first step in the whole pipeline. But man, closed source software. I mean, I'm a really big fan of open source software. And, Partly because people actually designed it uh, to be shared with other people. So they actually make sure they keep to certain uh, uh, like build systems, standard build systems. So then relatively easy to build open source sof software, even though of course there are shitty parts sometimes as well. But in closed source software, people use build script, hard code locations, <laughs> uh, binary files, who knows where they come from, like library SO files. Someone once built them, put them in a repository, and you actually have to use them. Uh, also, like huge build, uh, a typical package in Nix package is probably like a few, uh, maybe a few megabytes. Man, I think my first build of Logic Blocks was about two and a half gigabytes. So it gives all kinds of troubles. Um, but also, no, let's just download something from the from the network. It's a typical problem we have when we package uh, package in Nix, right? Oh man, or even worse, not, not just using one language, <laughs> use, use six languages. So it's all kind of nice if you have one NPM package and th that's it, but oh man, imagine using Java, Scala, C++, whatever language they can think of that was best to suit uh, their purposes at the same time. Um, so okay, you've nixified your build, and I must say it was very ugly at the beginning. <laughs> it was a very big script hacking around all these kinds of hard-coded locations. Uh, but of course you need to run it continuously, so that's why we have Hydra. We all know this, uh, uh, this screen, at least I hope you do, because this is kind of the main uh, server uh, in the, <laughs> the whole Nixosphere. Um, so why I like Hydra, it's uh, basically, it's again, most of the advantages here are actually caused by Nix, so it's basically a, a generalized Nix runner, in my opinion. Kind of, it's like a, a Nix scheduler, in a sense. Um, 
and that's uh, all bills are cons uh, consolidated in one language, Nix. And to my, in my opinion, that's really nice because <laughs> I hate Bash. And not because you cannot do good things in Bash, but it seems to be that all programmers always forget everything they learned about programming in Bash. I don't know why it is. <laughs> and probably I do the same, so <laughs> it's not like I'm blaming others. I'm just... Uh, as bad, and I, I need some guidance, and, and Nix gives me uh, this guidance, basically. So, less maintenance in the sense that you don't have to maintain computers, like uh, we had this Jenkins machine that one version had to have uh, GCC 4.2 and one GCC, you know, I don't know, some other version. Um, also, want to be able to reproduce the build, have caching of builds, which is very important when you want to compose builds. Uh, and I want to integrate it with our deployment tools. So, to you who have never installed Hydra, uh, we might call some uh, things and you think like, what the hell is a job set, or what is a job, or what is a build? So in Hydra, you can actually group builds together in projects. So for example, at Logic Blocks, we have for each of our clients, we have a project uh, for our platform. Um, and then we have a concept of job sets. It's basically, uh, you can see it maybe as a, you want to build a branch of your product. Uh, or a pull request, and then you create a job set, and the result of a job set well, is actually a set of builds. But it can be multiple things. Um, so the features that are important for us, and that we use a lot, is the fact that it's so easy in Hydra to create clones of job sets and build branches. Uh, but also, uh, the ability to compose multiple builds is one logical build. So, let's see. In our uh, Hydra, we have 19 projects and about 205 active job sets. So that's actually a lot. Um, so what do we build? Uh, we built our platform. So I'm saying that uh, we build a, a database platform. Uh, and this is our main uh, build for things. So I had to kind of rotate it to make sure that it's fitted on the screen. Uh, so if everybody can... <laughs> move over, <laughs> and then you can see that we, we have a lot of builds. And that's not because uh, our platform might be just 50 of them, which is probably like a, a third of it, uh, but we have a lot of things that we also trigger. Things like benchmarks or tests or things related to deployment or you want to try uh, to build client application. <coughs> so we have a few different types of builds. So, and that's for a reason that our builds are getting so huge in the time of build time that they actually consume, that we cannot commit, uh, basically build on any, every commit. Uh, but we actually do do that, but we just use a smaller subset of, uh, of builds. So, for example, if somebody commits something in our uh, platform, uh, that triggers about 90 builds, which is kind of like three hours worth of builds if you would do it in a sequence. Uh, we also have in nightly integration builds where we also build our client applications with it to validate if, let's say, a change in the platform breaks something uh, in those applications. And uh, then it gets a bit harder because each commit will actually cost 300 builds uh, and 120 hours of builds worth. So let's say if we do that on every commit, we would need a lot of build machines. Uh, we have a lot of them, but not that many. We're not uh, Google <laughs> or anything. Uh, so we're building client applications, and um, how does that typically look like? Um, so typically they have two inputs. It's basically the platform release, which is uh, uh, an argument to specify which release we actually want to use, uh, the source code of the, uh, the implementation of the application, and it typically looks like a function call that calls like a generic app job set, a function that builds a set of jobs, uh, based on how to build uh, the application. So there's a build LB config. We have a kind of like a standardized build system for LB applications that we can basically pass in uh, logic blocks, which is the database, and Blockswap, which is our application server. So in Hydra, that will look like this. It should look familiar for you guys. Um, there are like four builds that come out of this function. One is the actual build of the application, including the running of the test. But also, you can actually download a tarballed version of uh, what comes out of it, so that the developers can just download it instead of, let's say, building it for a few hours on their own uh, machines. 
Um, and there we do some basic testing that is generic for each application. And applications can actually add their own tests and it will show up as extra job sets. So another thing that's important is the Charon closure. So probably not everybody knows, but Nixops was once called Charon uh, when we wrote our first paper about it. Uh, but nobody liked that name, so we <laughs> chose the boring Nixops name. Um, so Oli Charles, he explains how they are using uh, channels to do deployments. We actually do something similar, only I don't make it a channel, but uh, we basically create a composite build uh, of all the dependencies needed for deployments. So what you see here is uh, a store path, uh, which is the Haran closure, which contains everything we need for deployment. Um, so that's the LB application. It's also software dependencies, like the platform or the application server, the operating system, next packages, some generic uh, system configuration files, how to install LB, uh, monitoring stuff, and the machine definitions, which are part of the source code of the application. So basically, if we want to deploy, we can just give it this path, put the next path correctly, and it will find everything you need for the deployment, and basically it will just run. So I thought it was very interesting seeing that Ollie Charles actually did something similar uh, at Finder. Uh, it's good to know that uh, people have similar ideas, uh, basically. So I explained that, of course, I started building uh, stuff with Nix, and we couldn't use it for the whole thing, like the deployments. And of course, they want to use uh, CentOS. I hate CentOS. But the nice thing about CentOS is that uh, one thing that I hate more about CentOS uh, than CentOS is the fact that people build CentOS images manually. Because building things manually, of course, that's, that's the evil. <laughs> so uh, what they actually did is I actually automated the CentOS image generation so that at least we had a declarative specification of what is in our CentOS image instead of somebody actually making the image, changing some stuff, then cleaning out the SSH daemon public key, uh, you know, all the kinds of things that is needed to actually fix all kinds of impure stuff when you create something like that. And one thing that's really important uh, about this is that Nix packages has a lot of weird functions in them. So one of them uh, is the run in Linux VM, where you can basically give it a Nix build, and it will just run in a VM magically. So I think it starts up some Kimu stuff. Don't really know the specifics, but it just works. So if you ever need a build that actually needs root, for example, to create a, a file system or something like that, you can actually just use this function. It's awesome, in my opinion. Uh, so it's also used for like EC2 and the uh, images for like uh, Google Cloud and Firstalbox. So there's a reference there, so make sure to check it out because I think this is one of these things that you don't really necessarily think of that that exists, but it's undocumented but still super awesome. Um, so we, we actually use that also to uh, test our platform. So we actually provide a binary release to our uh, clients and to our developers. And of course, they're using like Ubuntu and Fedora, but, but I don't want to have Fedora and Ubuntu machines in my build farm because I have to manage them and install them and maybe I have to use Puppet or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so, so we just do it in Nix. Because in Nix, you can actually build these kind of things declaratively. So here you see an example of, uh, well, you see the basic dependencies that LB has. So we need to have bash installs, we need to have Java, Python, and some proc PS. That's probably, I don't know for the PS tool or something like that. And uh, we have a function called test download package, which basically does the equivalent of downloading the package, unpacking it, running some basic tests on it. And this is all done inside a Nix build. So it integrates into Hydra uh, like automatically. So it's really nice. I mean, there's support for CentOS, Fedora, Ubuntu, Debian, whatever. Hmm? Oh, really? I haven't used that yet. Um, I always say we need to build everything. So also we build our documentation uh, automatically because doing things manually is, is super evil and things will get not synchronized. So our documentation is typically uh, built continuously and every night there's actually a deployment going to our website to make sure that uh, our clients have uh, always up-to-date documentation. So one thing that we have been uh, using uh, Hydra a lot for, uh, and mostly since this year, because we started uh, a designated benchmark team, which is very important for database, because you kind of want to know 
when you uh, introduce a performance regression, is uh, so we introduced uh, a lot of benchmarking in our uh, uh, in our builds. But benchmarking is kind of tricky when you have a build farm because that you kind of want to run in a consistent environment. Uh, so what you cannot do is have two uh, builds at the same time because it will actually influence things because the, there will be I/O used by multiple processes. Um, or CPU used, so you need to make sure that these kind of builds can run at the same, uh, in the same consistent way. So how we have solved that is basically having a, a subset of our build farm in Hydra that only allows one build at, at a time. But the Hydra scheduler actually was kind of dumb. I mean, I explained that yesterday. Um, and that caused a lot of uh, contention on the build farm where the normal builds actually wouldn't go through because all the benchmark builds were waiting for a, a build slot. So that's also one of the reasons why Ilco uh, improved uh, our scheduler in the Hydra Q runner, uh, so that we can actually run these mass scale uh, benchmarks on there as well. Um, so when you do benchmarking, there are a few things that you actually want to take into consideration. So the data set that goes in, so you can have data sets from one gigabyte, 10 gigabytes, 100 gigabytes, but also things like the software, which platform, uh, which version, <laughs> which type of benchmark you actually want to run, but also what type of CPU you want to run it on, how much memory, how much storage, what type of storage. And these kind of combinations uh, are really nice to program in uh, Nix, because we have these language to, and uh, the tools to actually describe all of these things. So we have NixOS for, for the, uh, let's see, the system, and Nix for the versions, data set that's basically just defined as a, as a list, uh, but also NixOps to actually deploy new instances on EC2 for machines that uh, we could normally not really buy ourselves. So we have uh, benchmarks that go against a terabyte of data, but we don't have a build machine to actually <laughs> fit that on. So what uh, Ilko uh, developed was the Hydra EC2 provisioner, where given a certain uh, type of uh, feature that we need, like memory or storage, we actually deploy a new machine where that, that actually will be built. And that's really nice because now we can actually run benchmarks on really big job sets, which we couldn't do before. So I started at Logicbox in 2011, um, and we started out with three Linux machines. At some point we got a Mac. Um, but I, I was located in Utrecht, and our office is in Atlanta. So you get the problem like, you buy hardware, and hardware dies. I hate hardware. So we actually needed IT people to actually respond quickly. And of course, like any company, our IT department has a lot of stuff, other stuff to do. So the response time was pretty slow. So after about two years, uh, we actually decided to run all our uh, build farm outside of uh, our, uh, like our uh, on-premise network. And we actually moved to Hetzner. Uh, and, I mean, Aslich, he made the Hetzner backend, and I'm so thankful for him that he did, because it's awesome, and it has saved us so much work. Uh, and nowadays we have 21 machines at Hetzner, uh, but also two Mac OS X uh, machines, not at Hetzner, because they don't do that, but there's an American company called Mac Stadium, where you can basically hire, uh, or re uh, re it's not hire, rent uh, the Mac hardware, and basically you pay some money for the hosting, uh, so we have also kind of, it's not cloud, but they deliver usually within two hours if you need extra capacity, so it's actually pretty awesome. Uh, and it's much cheaper than EC2, because of course we could actually run 24-7 on EC2, but then our bill would go skyrocket, uh, and it's already pretty high, so uh, that's probably not a good idea. Uh, kind of to show you how our, so this is the beginning when I uh, joined Logic Blocks. <laughs> Uh, this is a graph that shows the number of builds. So our Hydra is called Bob the Builder. And uh, so if you have children, you know what this is about. Uh, and uh, you see there's a, a big steep, uh, like in the first year, we went from zero to, well, I don't know, 30,000 a month. Oh yeah, so it's per month, it's good to know. So uh, currently we do about, I don't know, 1,200 builds a day uh, with, uh, with Hydra. But more importantly, I told you that we do benchmark builds a lot more since this year. You can see the spike there because that's, these benchmarks typically run really long, especially when you have these longer uh, job sets. So I think it's uh, tripled the time that we spent uh, in the number of built hours. So if we would have run it uh, sequentially. Um, so 
Okay, now I've got all the builds. The build farm, we're testing everything, so it's really nice. Now we need to start deploying. Um, so, for you guys who might not know exactly what NixOps is, it's basically a tool to deploy a set of NixOS machines. Uh, and that can be to anything. It can be to like the cloud, or it can be to on-premise machines. Uh, it's based on Nix. Uh, it uses the Nix language to actually describe it. Actually, it uses the NixOS module system as well. So I think it has an expressive configuration language, which is nice. It's also nice and composable. Um, and it has a, kind of a separation, or at least it allows you to have a separate sep uh, a separation of logical and physical aspects of the deployment. So what that means is that uh, on one case, we actually want to describe what is deployed to a system. I want to have a running LB instance, or like a, a database running, or I want to have a web server running. And on the other side, you actually want to describe where you want to deploy it to. So that's typically, I want to deploy it to EC2 on this instance size, or I want to deploy it to VirtualBox. So that's useful for a lot of things like development, but also for, let's say, if a client needs to go to a different cloud provider, you actually want to, don't want to do too much of uh, changes. So that's how it looks like in a picture. So the typical example of NixOps uh, looks like this. So you have this functional, so I want to have the NixOS homepage, and I want to deploy it to EC2. Well, it turns out when you do a lot of deployments, what will happen is people will start copying this part, make a copy of it, change it, and of course code cloning results in all kinds of inconsistent deployments. Uh, so what we have done a lot lately is because a lot of these client applications that we're deploying, we actually want all kinds of different versions running. Some with a smaller data set, some with a bigger data set. But you also have the variability between production and, and development environments. So what our deployments typically look like nowadays is uh, uh, it has actually arguments. So it's actually a function. Uh, which capture this variability. So things like which AWS account to deploy to, uh, which region, uh, which instance type. Do you want to have the batch enabled? Because sometimes, let's say during development, you don't want batches to trigger. Uh, but also, like, is it a production system? So we are a bit stricter with our production system, so we want to make sure that all the monitoring is set up correctly. Uh, so these kind of things you can cover with uh, these arguments. Uh, and I think that's a very nice thing because it kind of decl declares what your variability in the different deployments are uh, without needing to copy the, the files around. So do we use NixOps? Oh yeah. Uh, we have networks and clusters up to 54 machines in one functional unit. So you can imagine database wants to do replication, all kinds of uh, clustering. Uh, so our biggest network is 54 machines. Um, so I went, I went to dig into all the logs to see how many times people did what. So there were 100 NixOps create uh, calls being done, uh, 88 delete. So that basically means there were 100 new deployments and 88 thrown away. Uh, 1,700 times people called uh, NixOps deploy, which basically means there can be anything from, let's say, a configuration change to a full-scale new deployment. Uh, and 300 environments have been destroyed. Uh, basically, you kill the machines then, but it can be that, for example, you want to redeploy it from scratch again. Uh, and this is being done by 40 different people in the company. So, to give you an idea about how many servers we run with NixOS and NixOps, is, uh, we have a lot of internal infrastructure. You think like the build farm runs on, uh, like on Hetzner, but we also have some uh, local servers in the on premise, but uh, EC2 on Google Cloud. We have about 50 of them. Uh, for our clients, we have a whole lot more. Uh, last I checked, like three days ago, it was 550 machines uh, that we deploy for clients. So that includes like big networks like that have 50 machines, right? So it doesn't, doesn't mean we have 500 deployments, but at least, uh, uh, yeah, there's quite a lot of machines. Uh, so most of our deployments are kind of like static deployments. So this has a fixed number of machines. Uh, but of course, when you use the cloud, you want to do all kinds of dynamic scaling. So we have a system uh, to offload some work for applications, but also for developers, where they can send some work to be done. Uh, and that is actually running continuously, and it has, uh, at any time of the week, uh, it has either from zero to 1,500 machines running concurrently. Uh, so when Ilko was showing that graph of the unique IP addresses, that was probably me 
<laughs> or at least part of it. <laughs> um, so maybe a, a talk a bit about uh, how we actually uh, arrange all these deployments, uh, because there's 40 people actually doing it. Uh, we have different clients, and we don't want everybody to have access to all, all the systems, so you want to make sure you kind of uh, separate uh, people uh, and groups from uh, certain deployments. Also, like operations, they want to have full control of the production environment, so we can never touch them. And stuff. So basically, we have uh, uh, two deployment machines. There are actually three, but uh, two main ones, uh, one for de development and one for production, uh, where we have for each client a different... Uh, uh, user accounts, uh, which they can sudo into, uh, at least if you have the rights to uh, go to a client's uh, system and deploy there. So that's how most people work. Uh, but there are some issues with that, because, I mean, go tell a salesperson to SSH into a machine and then run some kind of script, it's kind of scary for them. Um, so they don't really like that so much. Uh, but there's also another problem. So in NixOps, we actually store the credentials for the cloud that we're using uh, uh, in the home directory of the user where you're running NixOps. So they call that, uh, for example, for EC2, it's the EC2 keys file in the home directory. It basically means that anybody who has access to the user account will actually be able to just grab these credentials. Uh, and that's, of course, a bad situation. So we actually want to make sure that that uh, uh, gets a bit improved. Uh, but even worse is, we have this nice language to describe our deployments, and you think that we have super consistent deployments, but what actually happens is that uh, when people are inconsistent in, for example, how they check out files, which files they use, or that suddenly they share a, a checkout of a, a repository between two deployments, they actually start to interact because people are not disciplined enough to, let's say, use... Uh, uh, the correct processes for it. So that basically means that you still get, in you have a nice language to actually de deploy your stuff, but you can still get incorrect uh, and inconsistent uh, deployment. So a second thing is, I said that I showed some statistics about how many people were deploying. It's actually kind of hard to figure that out. So NixOps actually logs every command that you're running to the syslog and also logs who's actually doing it. So it is actually possible, but it's still not very easy to do. Uh, so we are, uh, well, actually we, uh, uh, one of my colleagues, Usama, uh, from Tunis, he's uh, going to work on the NixOps dashboard, which will be a web UI for NixOps, which will make it easier for, let's say, our salespeople to spin up environments, uh, but also mitigate a few of the, the problems that we had with uh, NixOps. Uh, it will be open source, so I'm sure that, let's say, in the next few months, uh, it will just show up and we'll announce it uh, once we have a usable version. I hope you guys will start using it, or at least try it. So again, we want to have a bit improved security by actually not allowing uh, people direct access to the AWS uh, APIs. Uh, we want to have deeper operational visibility so that we can see what's going on, because currently we have 40 people going somewhere. And for example, when you deploy something to the same deployment as two users, the user just gets like, yeah, there's a lock on it but doesn't know what the other user is actually doing. Uh, so it would be actually nice if you just in the web interface it says like, no, these operations are actually running, and this user is doing that. Uh, and uh, it's very important, we want to have a proper audit trail, so uh, by redesigning this, we want to make sure that that's all covered. Um, well, and again, this consistency issue, things like checking out source code for the Nix expressions uh, to deploy, we want to make sure that that's also structured, and basically by providing an API slash uh, web user interface, uh, that will actually improve as well. Uh, partly because we'll just basically allow uh, only changes that were made in source control to be uh, used. Um, so, to uh, summarize, I think I was a bit quick maybe, but uh, that's okay, you can have lunch. Uh, we want to have reproducible, composable builds with traceability. So that's very important for me. I really want to know what's going on in the system when there is a problem. We want to know what changed, for which reason, and we want to be able to actually efficiently look that up, which I think Nix and Hydra give, uh, give us that opportunity. So we want to have reproducible system configuration. No more changing files on the servers like we were doing before. And also making sure that we don't click in the AWS console all kinds of infrastructure together uh, in a manual way. We need to uh, do automation of provisioning and creating these reproducible networks as well. 
So I want to say it's like Nix helps us a lot. The fact that you guys are here, so many people, it, 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 it's awesome. And the Nixos community has given us a lot of things, like, for example, the Hetzner backend of Nixops uh, that saved us so much time. So LogicBox is also thankful for that, and that's why we try to give back uh, at least changes to uh, Nix, Nix packages, Hydra, and Nixops back to the community. Uh, but they also support our infrastructure. So the fact that we have such a reliable uh, binary cache nowadays, that's uh, fully being paid for by LogicBox. Uh, so it's hosted on the EC2. Uh, on S3 uh, with CloudFront, and then make sure that we have reliable caches, uh, and make sure that people who deploy over the world actually have a decent speed, which was kind of an issue before when we were just hosted in the data center of uh, TU Delft. Uh, so I'm very happy that they're so supportive of, of uh, all this. So this is my last slide. Thank you for listening, and I uh, hope you guys have some questions. Okay, we have a bit of time for <laughs> questions. So it's, yeah. uh, I'm curious if you ever experimented with uh, uh, in, having like continuous integration or anything. So taking outputs from Hydra and then deploying them immediately with Nix Ops. If yeah, so we actually do that. So let me go back to one of the slides because I probably didn't mention it clearly enough. Uh, and I kind of skipped over it. So uh, this is an expression that uh, uh, shows how to build a client application. And so sometimes, uh, usually we work with fixed releases. So we, every month we do a release uh, that is, like, let's say, uh, double-checked also manually, except for the, uh, the automated part. Uh, so you can actually pass it like a version identifier, so it's like the, described there in the default value on top. But what we actually also do, uh, what actually happens a lot, is that people build their applications against uh, in the integration build. So that's, for example, a nightly build or, let's say, the continuous build. And they can basically just configure that by, in Hydra, saying, uh, changing the, uh, the input from, uh, let's say, not a string, but to a previous Hydra build, and people point to the correct build, and that will be automatically used. Application will be built, and that's immediately deployable in NixOps. So, yes. And then, um, uh, just had a follow-up question, is do you see uh, any way that NixOps can help with orchestration? Like, is that was that ever an issue? Like, right now you are defining all of your services and deploying them with NixOps, but mm -hmm. maybe there's some binding between which machines get which and all this, but uh, I'm wondering if you see opportunity there to, to say, to not have to specify that and do some smart allocation of where the applications no, are running. I think that's more like a bit more uh, in the space of uh, Disnix, who's actually doing that. Uh, NixOps is really about uh, machine configuration. And I don't think that it's uh, necessarily a good idea to implement, let's say, such an orchestration in, in NixOps it's, itself. I think uh, it's a really good idea to look into the work that Sander has been doing on this Nix, because that's actually meant specifically designed for such a, such a scenario. Thank you. Um, so could you go forward to the test download slide? I think it's uh, yeah, so, so what is that actually downloading? Is that waiting for a commit to happen, triggering a Hydra build, and then immediately uploading something, and then trying to download it again? Or is that... Like well, so actually, it doesn't really do the downloading in the sense that it will have it av uh, available, but it will actually do the unpacking. Okay. Uh, so the, the function name is, might, might be a misnomer, because it's not actually going to the network. It's basically testing what comes out of, let's say, our integration build or our continuous build, and uh, extracting that and uh, check, doing basic tests on, well, in this case, Fedora. Okay, have you, have you considered having a Hydra drop that does like an upload to a HTTP server just to know, kind of know that you've got that full flow working? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of tricky because yeah, it's such an impure mm. thing, so we try to avoid, uh, try to avoid uh, doing that. Okay. So, and I mean, you have typical basically, basically checks maybe with ping them to see if, actually, uh, if you can actually download it, so there's not necessarily that much of a need uh, for it. Uh, I have a question about Hydra. Uh, have you had any thoughts of making it more declarative, like declare the, the projects in Nix or in some? Um, 
Yeah, we've considered it, but we never got around to actually implementing it. But it would actually be nice because then you can track change, change over time. So currently, Hydra doesn't check, let's say, the, the job level specification of uh, the inputs over time. But it does track, let's say, the individual revisions that have been used. So it would indeed be a nice feature uh, to add Hydra uh, to be more declarative. Yeah. But it also... Uh, kind of, there's a downside to it, uh, of course, uh, in the sense of usability. So, for example, it, it might be harder for, let's say, our consultants to actually make a quick change uh, in the user interface. Uh, it will be harder, let's say, if they need to do it in code. So that's kind of, uh, it's kind of a trade-off. Yeah. Oh, there's one there. Uh, yeah, you mentioned you know the um, dealing with your build or your deploy users and all that and everything mm -hmm. that goes on with there. We have similar issues you now. I think we you know we run Ansible and stuff like that, but the same problem exists. Keys, SSH mm -hmm. keys, etc., um, are just right there for the taking once yeah. the user's in there. Have you thought about how you do that? I mean, it sounds like the web UI helps because that pushes you back away from the machine. But I mean, I don't want to use a web UI. I want to use my command line. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you had thought about any ideas on no, how to deal with so, that. So uh, the web UI, or it, it will actually be an API. So it will actually uh, you'll be able to develop tools to actually uh, call there as well. But then you actually still have to say the issue is still there, right? Uh, so we'll have to look into uh, uh, solving the credential issues not just by the UI uh, because that's just one layer, but maybe by some other uh, uh, key management system uh, like I don't know. Uh, these guys from HashiCorp have some interesting stuff. Yeah. Hey, it's not a question, more of a remark. Like uh, that, maybe before being very ambitious with like nixifying job sets, we can do Hydra CLI properly, and and from there we can sort of like be more declarative, I guess. At you know, without doing a drastic step to to refactor everything. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's a good idea. I think it would be better to actually focus on making it, it more declarative because in the CLI you'll still have the same issue as a web interface. It's basically just a different vehicle uh, to do this imperative changing of your... Well, uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. We could kind of consider it. But uh, if you feel like you... Uh, if you ever want to contribute to Hydra, feel free to... Uh, yeah. 